to the first of the Monday night guest lecture series for 1994-95. I'm Dave Ferguson from the Department of Landscape Architecture. Our speaker tonight represents an area of increasing importance to those of us who are interested in sustainable design and development. As our society begins to accept concepts of sustainable approaches to the design of our buildings and our landscapes and our cities, the means of implementing those concepts becomes a primary consideration. Dr. Bill Wolverton has spent his entire career seeking innovative approaches to combining natural ecological systems and human building and land uses. Dr. Wolverton was a research scientist with NASA for over 30 years prior to establishing the firm of Wolverton Environmental Services, Inc. He has an undergraduate degree in chemistry and has done graduate studies in biochemistry, microbiology, and marine biology. His PhD is in environmental engineering. While with NASA, Dr. Wolverton directed the development of a closed ecological life support system that would exist uh, in habitats on the moon and Mars in the next couple of decades. His work is also centered on solving earthly environmental problems such as wastewater treatment through aquatic plant systems and combined air wastewater purification systems. He's developed projects for industrial and domestic sewage treatment and water purification in cities and towns around the country. He's published over 70 technical papers. He's lectured extensively in this country and abroad. He's won numerous awards and he holds several patents on the processes he's developed. One of the projects he's worked on is the award-winning Crosby Arboretum in Louisiana, where several of us just visited uh, yesterday, in fact, uh, which was designed by land the landscape architecture firm of Andrew Pogon and architect Faye Jones, and I think that places him in very good company. We look forward to the insights he'll provide tonight on the new technological thinking which we will all need as environmental designers in the 21st century. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Bill Wolverton.
you look at those slides up in the right hand corner, there's a little number. If you can just Twenty-five years ago, when Neil Armstrong and Love all first stepped on the moon and looked back, this is the view they saw. Now, we all know that this was one of the greatest engineering feats in the world. But to me, even more important was, as we look back on planet Earth, we got a totally different perspective. It's a very small planet looking from the moon. It's a very fragile planet. And we begin to understand and appreciate why we could live on planet Earth. What is the life support system? Why is there not such a system on the moon? Now, looking at that and thinking of how one day we could perfect a system to support life on this moon that we're looking for, and on Mars, the question was, how do we do it? And to do that, in my way of thinking, is we had to understand how did the life support system evolve on planet Earth. And we must mimic that system in some closed system on the moon or Mars is, was my way of thinking. Now, in 1973, when we had Skylab, we did analysis of the environment inside Skylab, and to our surprise, we found, identified, 107 volatile organic chemicals inside the cabin of Skylab. In other words, if the astronaut didn't have a filtration system that was breathing air from, these are just a few of the chemicals that he would be breathing in. That set NASA to think any closed ecological life support system is going to have a major indoor air pollution problem that we must address. Ten years later, in 1983, EPA identified even more, 350 volatile organics, and here's just a few of those, in a nursing home, in a modern energy efficient building nursing home in Washington, D.C. So, the era of indoor air pollution, or sick building syndrome, had evolved. Now, we know if you follow the sick building syndrome and EPA studies in the last few years, uh, they tell us, and I believe it, it's correct, that indoor air pollution is costing approximately $60 billion per year in health costs, uh, lost time and other problems. Now, that's a lot of money. And since we spend up to 90% of our time indoors, the major air pollution problem facing modern day society is indoor air pollution. Now if one thinks if you build a tightly sealed structure, fill it full of synthetics such as wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, a particle board furniture, then put people in there. How in the world could you expect to have clean air? So I'm not surprised at the problems we have. Now, the question is, how do we solve that problem? My solution was to go back and say, where did the clean air and the clean water come from originally? Nature, green, living, photosynthesizing plants and their associated microorganisms is what gave it to it on planet Earth. So nature's solution to this indoor air pollution problem and the water problem is plant microbial ecology. Now plant microbial ecology is the interaction of the plant and its root microbes 
in a symbiotic relationship. The first subject that I'm going to cover this evening will be indoor plants, low light requiring a house plant. Later on, hopefully, we'll get to the outside aquatic plants for wastewater treatment. But the key to the whole pure air on this earth or in a building, if we use indoor plants, is the plant and the microbes that the plants grow and cultivate around the roots, which we call the rhizosphere. Now, we know that each plant on this earth is like each individual. We all have different fingerprints. Each plant, nature has given it a genetic code that will allow it to excrete certain nutrient solutions to cultivate microbes on and around its roots, which we call the rhizosphere, that that plant needs to survive. Now, it depends on where that plant evolved. For instance, most of the low light requiring house plants evolved underneath the canopy of the tropical rainfall where the light is low, and that's why they can tolerate low light, and that's why we move them in called house plants. Now, they're also in an environment to where that plant can't move. It's got to derive its sole source of survival from where its roots are anchored in the soil. Therefore, the leaves that fall, the animal debris, anything that falls on the jungle floor, that plant has to cultivate, maintain microbes capable of rapidly biodegrading these leaves, tannic acids, humic acids, very complex organic structures, and break them down and mineralize them so the plant can use them as food. Now, once you take that plant out of that environment and move it into a home, it doesn't know that it's in the home genetically, and it's still cultivates the same microbes, and it turns out that those microbes that are capable of breaking down these exotic organic structures such as tannic acid, humic acids, are very capable of biodegrading simple compounds such as formaldehyde, benzene, trichloroethylene, and the hundreds of others that are given off from rugs, carpet, furniture, everything we find in buildings. Now what we did years ago is start to see what plants are the best plants for removing certain chemicals? So we took seal chambers, we did extensive studies of plants, and to date, we've screened over 40 plants and cataloged their ability to remove substances such as formaldehyde. We've even done orchids, as you can see in this, this study, orchids. To give you an example of a reef of palm, Here's a, a number of chemicals we tested that's found indoors, whether they are from a fingernail polish remover or from our own exhaled breath. Each breath we exhale, we put small amounts, we dump small amounts, trace levels of hundreds of volatile organics into the room in which we're, we're living. This room is full of various chemicals now from the fact that we're living and breathing it. Uh, ethyl alcohol, methyl alcohol, and there's dozens of others. Those are just a few that we tested uh, the areca palm, which is a tropical rainforest plant. Now, some of our earlier studies, and still have, and you always have critics and criticism, and one of the uh, criticisms was that formaldehyde and other chemicals are continuously given off from rugs or furniture or paneling. And if plants absorb them, literally suck them in, uh, the more they pull out, the more that will outgas. So eventually the plant will become saturated, die, and dump it all back into the room, and you've got a worse mess and you started with the worst problem. Uh, now to address that and to answer that, what we did, we took some interior paneling, uh, cut two pieces, drilled holes in them so that we could uh, increase the outgassing of formaldehyde from the urea formaldehyde resin it's constructed with. We put one in a single chamber with a beaker of water so that we can simulate the humidity because plants transpire moisture. When you seal a plant in the chamber, it's going to be humid. Then we put a lay palm in one with the same uh, boards and uh, 
we ran them for days. And here's some of the data that we, if you will notice, the outgassing of formaldehyde depended more on the temperature than the humidity. But the one that had the lead palm in it, instead of becoming saturated and dying, if you will notice, it increased in its efficiency, its ability to remove formaldehyde each day. It got better and better. Now, why that was happening? Uh, what we found out later on was that the microbes that this plant was culturing in its soil and its rises, they were adapting to utilizing formaldehyde as a source of energy and food. And as it went through this adaptation, for instance, the microbes that were there originally, most of them may have been killed by the formaldehyde, but the ones that adapted and these microbes, mostly uh, supons, can go through a generation time in 15 or 20 minutes. So within uh, 24 hours, we had uh, these microbes had been replaced by adaptive, what we call superbugs. And if you're familiar with bioremediation, that's the whole concept of bioremediation, is to adapting microorganisms to rapidly utilize certain chemicals right now. So what we found in this study was if you put a plant in a chamber or in a room that's outgassing formaldehyde, it will not become saturated and die. It will create an environment through adaptation to better utilize it and improve with time. Now to find out again, we went back to the lab, we cultured the microbes, around the different plants to find out why some was better than others. Now here's a, a chart that gives you an example. We took potting soil from the same bag, we potted up three pots. One, we planted a peace lily. Uh, in the middle one, in the bottom, we planted a colacho. And one, we left just in potting soil. And we watered and fertilized all of these the same amount. Uh, and after seven days, we put them in the chamber, we tested them for their ability to remove formaldehyde. And you can see there's a world of difference. We allowed this to go on for five months and we tested again. Now look and see how the peace lily, now the peace lily is a tropical rainforest type plant. The colancho evolved in a more arid type. It has very little debris uh, to biodegrade or recycle, mostly sand or dry dirt. Uh, therefore, nature gave it a whole different set of microbes. And if you'll see over in the right hand column, uh, the Colacho had gram positive rhymes, the fresh potting salt had, but the peace lily had gram negative, and again, once we identified those, most of the pseudomonas, and pseudomonas can rapidly adapt uh, in a very short period of time. So, what we demonstrated here is that when you put a plant in a pot, potting soil, it goes through a process of, of cultivating the right type microbes, and if you test one plant and you don't know the age, you may get different data. So. Uh, it's important to know the age of the plant compared to another plant for the type of data one can get. Now, again, I said the microbes that we found in the soil around the roots of the most effective plants were predominantly pseudomonas. We went back and screened the literature over 30 years, and we found that microbiologists, this is just some of the chemicals that they have found that soil, pseudomonas extracted from soil were very effective in biodegrading. So the basis, the scientific basis for this is there. It's nothing new and novel. It's just parts of the puzzles of nature that we have been slowly putting together and where the plant cultivates and maintains the right type of microbes instead of having a microbiologist in a lab continuously mixing up a culture to sustain microbes, the plant is doing it because nature tells that plant 
it needs certain microbes for its survival. Now, to give you another example of what's going on, we went back in the literature, back to 1963, agronomists, they were studying soybeans to try to figure out oh, what kind of microbes they had in the rice this year to enhance the production of soybeans. It had nothing to do with air purification. But we found an interesting phenomenon. If you look at the, at the bacteria they cultured in uh, soybean root extract individually, then they mixed them together, and what happened? The bacteria that survived and suppressed the growth of all the others were pseudomonas. Now, we also, we wanted to know what part the plant leaves play, what part do the soil play, and we took uh, certain plants here with formaldehyde and xylene, and we put them uh, in experimental chambers where only the soil was exposed, and the soil was completely exposed. We ran a test, then we took sterilized sand, completely covered the soil so there was no soil exposed. We ran the studies again, and as we can see, the leaves are important. Now, what, why are the leaves important? We don't know exactly uh, why, but there's a couple of reasons uh, to explain that. One is that we know that certain plants can systemically absorb organic chemicals into their leaves and translocate. Some plants may metabolize them internally, and some plants we know can translocate them down to the roots where the pseudomonas or other microbes can biodegrade them. We also know that plants that evolve underneath the canopy of tropical rainforest, most of them have a high transpiration rate. In other words, they pump out moisture from the leaves at a high rate. And in doing that, they set up a current flow. As they pump out moisture from the leaves, they pull air down to the roots. That's how terrestrial plants, that uh, how they get oxygen in the root system, corn, soybeans, they have a high transpiration rate. They pull air down through and get the oxygen around the roots. Now, if that air has formaldehyde, benzene, or any other volatile substance, it's going to pull it down. So there's two mechanisms that we know of how plants, how the plant leaves can function to help transport uh, these uh, air pollutants in or air pollutants to the microbes. Now, there's a recent study just that's coming out in plant physiology uh, that the Germans did where they took this spider plant and uh, formaldehyde and repeated some work I did 10 years ago. And they found that the spider plant, in their studies, they had radioactive uh, uh, carbon, carbon 14, the label, that the plant itself played a major role internally in metabolizing formaldehyde. That's a new study that's coming out in the journals in the next few months. So the point here is, is to show you that we have done over the years, we have done a lot of work tracking down how nature cleans the air and water and how plants, particularly low light requiring house plants that we use indoors, properly designed to clean the indoor environment. Now, we know particularly in a cold climate, when you have a tightly sealed building in the wintertime, one of the major problems you have is low humidity. Low humidity dries out your nasal passages and makes you far more susceptible to viruses, indoor air pollutants, or other things. That's why you have more colds and viruses in the wintertime than in the summertime. We also know if you use electronic humidifiers and you do not use distilled water, you can get minerals uh, dispersed into the environment and get a white powder and that can cause respiratory problems. It can also, if you're not careful, grow a legionnaire's disease and cause problems. So we're finding out that house plants are nature's perfect humidifier. They not only humidify the air, producing mineral-free, microbial-free moisture, but 
some of the plants have built into the moisture that are whatever they're giving off some means that help suppress the growth of microbes and we'll cover that a little later on as we go along. Now, one of, EPA is not too keen on the idea of designing plants into buildings as a means to prevent sick building syndrome. And one of the reasons they, they claim is that if you fill a building full of plants, or put a large number of building or plants in a building, that you will increase the humidity and you will be overwhelmed by airborne molds or, or fungus and other uh, microbes. Uh, what we did is we took uh, this reaper palm, we put it in a chamber, uh, we sealed it up, we cultured the microbes in there with a the plant, uh, we put it out, exposed it out, and cultured it. And what we got was an indication that the plant was giving off something that suppressed, not enhanced, the growth of uh, airborne microbes, even though it increased the humidity. Later on, we'll, we'll talk some more about this. Now, since we have, we know that plants culture around our roots certain voracious microbes that can rapidly biodegrade toxic chemicals into air pollutants. The next step was, how can we take one plant and enhance it, or one plant can we cause it to increase its air purifying properties. So what we did, we designed a system of planter in which we added the most effective adsorbent materials such as activated carbon. We know that activated carbon, when you pull air through activated carbon that has airborne uh, chemicals, it can absorb, trap large quantities. But the problem is, after a while it becomes saturated, you've got to change it out and put another column in. So what we did, we took that filtering power of activated carbon, we used it in planting a plant and devised a means where we could pull air down through it, trap large quantities of these chemicals, move large volumes of air rapidly down through the filter, and trap it on this activated carbon, then allow the plant and the pseudomonas and other microbes to literally bio-regenerate, self-clean this carbon. In other words, they would uh, destroy, utilize the trapped organics as a source of energy and food and basically convert it into water and CO2, the organics. And it's kind of like a self-cleaning up. Uh, then you could uh, use nature in a more enhanced way along with man-made technology, mechanical devices, and merge them to produce highly efficient filter systems. And here's one of the systems, one of the uh, original versions that's on the market now. We've completely redesigned it. We have a new version coming out. If you're familiar with computers, it's like this is the 286 and we're getting ready to come out with a 486. So this one is on the market and it's been filtered, but we are negotiating uh, with a manufacturer now to come out with one that's going to be much, much superior because we've learned a lot over the years. But here's what it looks like. Now here is a plant. These are the flanks of leaves. This plant, you see, is a regular potted plant sitting to the right. Now this special planter filter can remove the same amount of formaldehyde and other airborne chemicals as 200 leaves. Now what that does, it begins to make a natural purification filter more appealing in areas where you couldn't design a large number of plants, uh, in a, a bedroom or a room where that you couldn't put a large number of plants in, you have an air quality problem. So the technology over the years, uh, the 25 years that I've been working with, we are, we're making tremendous headway in advancing the harnessing the power of nature. Now here's what, uh, after two years, the bioregenerative prop. This demonstrates the bioregenerative properties of these filters. Uh, one is a filter, a new filter, the one to the right, the other one is one to two years old. As you can see, it still is effective, maybe a little more effective. So the concept of using nature to bioregenerate is a viable, real, practical concept. 
Now, again, with, with NASA, about two years before I retired, I convinced NASA to give me enough money to create a tightly sealed structure, a bioregenerative structure, which we call a biohome. And this structure was not completely airtight. It was super tight, had an R insulation value of 40, uh, had a, uh, the insulation layer of thickness is 12 inches thick. And we designed it so a student could live in one side, completely recycle his waste, and to purify and revitalize the air in a tightly, super energy efficient structure to alleviate sick building syndrome. This is what the uh, bio home looked like. It was uh, 12 inches thick, tightly sealed. Now, when we first got the structure, set it up, it's made of total synthetics. And you walk into that building, your eyes burn, your throat starts to get scratchy. You get typical sick building syndrome. You can't stay in there. I couldn't stay in there. The other scientists couldn't stay in there. Uh, what we did is we pulled samples, ran it through a mass spec GC, and as you can see in the right, it was full of various exotic uh, chemicals that most synthetics are made of. Uh, we put plants in the structure, we equipped it, we left it for a week, we pulled the air, and as you can see, it, most of the chemicals had been removed. But more important, when you walk into that building, close the door, you do not experience sick building syndrome. Your eyes do not burn, your throat doesn't get scratchy. And this was about the same time, 1987, that EPA refurbished their headquarters at Waterside Mall in Washington. They pulled all the old carpet out, they put new carpet in, they put a new paneling in, and after a few days, they started to get sick. And uh, then, at first, the most sensitive sick building syndrome. Same thing we witnessed in this. Uh, then, as after about a year, there's about hundreds of them in the So, EPA was in a dilemma. They didn't know what to do. I think they finally stripped down all of the carpet, moved some of the people out to another building, and the last account I had, uh, the builder, the building, and the architect, or whoever did the work, had about a $35 million lawsuit. So I thought it was interesting uh, that in this first use of plants to solve sick building syndrome, that we solve a problem quite simply, and EPA still hasn't figured out how to really make a building clean without costing an arm away. But this is how the building was equipped, the living quarters of the building, the bio home. Uh, this is where the student slept, lived, had a kitchen, the whole convenience of home, and NASA furnished all the food and everything else and gave them rent free for a summer and paid. And the section you see in the back is where the waste is being recycled. Typical bathroom, all of the waste went into the next room next door, and we used uh, highlight requiring plants. This is before I discovered you could use low light requiring plants to wastewater. And the waste was all recycled through what is now called constructed wetlands on Mars footage. So what we did in that two years uh, is proof that one can take a structure, design plants into it, and it'd be healthy, even with all the synthetic materials. You can do it. We did it. We analyzed it with the most sophisticated equipment available, mass spec GC, and the most practical indicator people. Now, this was about the time that I was getting ready to retire, and uh, I told NASA, if you're going to, in the future, build a structure on the moon or Mars, 
you're going to have to load up the shovel, you're going to have to take some plants up there if you want to live. Now, you can take all of your engineering, sophisticated technology and get there. But if you want to live when you get there, you better take Mother Nature along with you. Now, realizing when I retire that the bio home would probably be stripped of all of that and made an office, that's the regular bureaucratic way to do it, uh, I said it on my wife that, hey, I'm getting ready to retire and we want this technology to go. You, uh, we need to build a structure just like it and the next step to move in. And I was doing quite well until I reminded her raw sewage had to be flushed into the house. And that set things back for a while because we live in a rural area down in Mississippi and she reminded me if the neighbors were here about that, they would try to have me committed to some mental institution. Because you know, no one likes to change. Change doesn't become easy. When you start flushing sewage in the house, uh, that's quite different from what we used to. But eventually, I convinced her that we would build onto our house a separate unit, merge it with the house, have it totally separate where you can close it off. It has its own heating, ventilation, air conditioning system where if you like, you can open doors and you'll just have a larger house. But you can also close it off. But you've got to flush the raw sewage in it. Now, remember in BioHome, we were looking at uh, aquatic plants. The interior plant industry and that's, as I retired, I became the scientific spokesperson for the Plant for Clean Air Council, which is a group that's dedicated to showing that interior plants can improve the indoor air quality. But the plant industry agreed if I could devise a means to treat the raw sewage and purify the air all indoors with low light requiring house plant, they would furnish all of the plants in the bureau. And that's what happened. We designed it in. Uh, you can see the old section to the right, or the new section to the right, the old section to the left. Now looking from inside the new section, if you will notice up at the top, you see those strange looking vents. It has a regular vent, it has a, uh, the heating air conditioning system's heat pump. But remember, if you burn something in the kitchen, or if you have odors in the bathroom, you can't just flush it outside. It's all got to be dealt with indoors, uh, simulating the fact that you're on the moon of Mars and you can't open the door. So the system was designed to handle it all indoors. Now, this is looking out into an L-shaped sunroom, or I call it my tropical rainforest. Now, if you will notice, there's sliding glass doors, two of them. They stay open, they were put there for a purpose. Now there's vents out there, it's all an integral part, but later on to test, do testing, it allowed me to close those doors, seal it off, and cut off the air conditioner to do any type of testing I might do with it. Now, like the biohome, this system was designed to be the only source of water and food for those plants. Uh, if you were on the moon, uh, that the whole concept of designing a closed ecological life support system is that human waste and waste products are all to be biologically recycled into plants to produce air and foods, etc. But in this case, I wanted to prove a point that it could be done. Now, one could put Miracle Grow or any other thing in and do the same thing, but I wanted to prove the point that it could be done because uh, there was a lot of people told me it couldn't be. And when you tell me it can't be done, uh, then it, it makes me determined. Now, as you see up to the right, the first section, the, they're more luscious than the others. Those are the sections that we see as the direct flush. Now that's designed for all sewing. <coughs> and uh, what, what are you doing with torrents? What are you doing all that? I've asked all these questions. Just like any other sector. Now that first section is it, separated. It has a layer about eight or nine inches down, a plexiglass 
system sets down full of holes and it's open underneath it so that there is an open place like a septic tank so that the, the bacteria can digest the clogged tissue and the soft. Then it comes up through and flows through specially designed insert chambers here that will allow you to use low light requiring house plant, whether they're water lovers, non-water lovers, cactus, uh, you can use any type plant you want to in this system because it's designed to allow them to fit into certain little inserts to where they're happy. Some of them would like to be further down in the water, some of them want to be where they can just feed out. So with this design, it not only allows you to do that, it allows you to rapidly rotate them. If they grow towards the window, you can take them in and out. So it's, it's a system designed with minimum maintenance. Because I know that architects, why you are a serious architect, and building managers, they, the reason they don't like plants put in buildings in pot, someone's got water, they over water, they get the carpet wet, and molds over. So realize that we have to have a system that is almost foolproof that you can design in, that's tied in, where you have to do very little of anything. And now this system has been in operation for five years. It's never been watered. It's never been fed. It's designed with expanded clay pebbles in it so that and we've been away from it for at least a month and no one had to water feed it because it has a water reservoir built into it automatically. Uh, so that uh, it's the way of the future in designing buildings. I, this is a sampling port that you come out of the septic tank, and it's, it's for sampling to analyze the efficiency of the wastewater. It's also put there for these few non-believers. Now, occasionally I get people in that don't believe it, they flush it, they run, they listen, they just think there's a trick to it. So those I invite to take the cap off and take a deep sniff. <laughs> and that comes, that comes right out of the septic tank portion of the So that makes believers out of unbelievers in a hurry. And I've had one or two that I had to go to the extreme and Anaerobic. Now, the septic tank bottom portion is anaerobic. There is a plexiglass shield, has little holes and it's full of aggravated carbon and expanded clay and plants are growing in so the gases, it's not sealed, the gases as they come up they're oxidized and scrubbed out and converted from sulfides to sulfates or nit whatever substance, deodorized and utilized as a plant food. Now here's the planter system, L shape, and they're modular units. They fit in modular units so that you architects in the next few years there'll be a manufacturer where you can Design them and, and you can put a fault front, whatever you want to, uh, and the modules fit right in. Uh, and it's my little tropical rainforest. Uh, sit out there and do my meditate, study, write. And as you can see, it's made up of an assortment of plants. Uh, and you do not have to sacrifice aesthetics. You can use the same plants that you put in, as they put in these lobbies of hotels. You can maintain your aesthetics, you can use the low light requiring plants, and you can, if you want to treat wastewater in yours, you can treat wastewater. It, this was a technological breakthrough, uh, which will be fully realized 20, 30 years from now. Now, to prove that the water coming out was clean, you have to have certain things. It's a bioassay system where the water comes out and you've got fish in it. And uh, that helps, besides the analysis, that helps uh, the average person that comes in, the news media, they want to see something like that. Here's the data, and as you can see in this data, we biologically stripped out the fecal colophon. And based on biological systems properly designed, uh, I have no doubt whatsoever that if one were to put in this system viruses or any type of pathogenic microorganisms, they would never get through the system because pathogenic microorganisms are quite host specific and when you put them in such a system, it's a very hostile environment and between the, all the little creatures, the protozoans and the other things that nature cultivates on and around the root system, 
And those plants, remember, they too excrete certain chemicals to suppress certain microbes that is not desirable, that might be harmful to them. So the uh, arsenal of weapons that nature has in controlling microbes, if you properly design it, now properly design it, you go from an anaerobic to an aerobic, and you stay aerobic and cultivate and you use different plants. Different plants excrete different substances. They have different families of microbes. So if you have a large one of those, I don't believe you can get pathogenic microorganisms <coughs> pardon me, through such a system. Now I'm sure there's people argue, argue, argue that point. But there's been quite a bit of studies done with constructed weapons which demonstrate that you can design them with proper attention time to remove pathogenic microorganisms. Now, again, remember I said one of the major complaints or criticisms or concerns that EPA had was if you put a lot of plants in a building, uh, they would increase the humidity and, and cause excessive microbes. Well, that's those sliding glass doors that I showed you. I closed those, turned off the heating system, and done six months of culture microbes all throughout the system. I went over in the other building in my wife's side in their bedroom where there's no plants and it had a humidity of what was it, average, these are average for six months, uh, 56%, cut off the heating and air conditioning system, try to uh, simulate. And when all of this data was generated, and it's been submitted for publication in the journal, uh, what we found is what I expected was that there was less, far less, airborne microbes and molds in the tropical rainforest with a humidity of over 70% than in that room without plants. Because again, remember, these plants evolved underneath the canopy of the tropical rainforest over eons where it is dark, damp, and warm. Ideal place for mildew and mold to grow. So nature had to give them again a genetic code to allow them to protect themselves in that environment. And we don't know yet what that is. Well, we, I suspect that there's certain traces of chemicals that are given off with the moisture as it transpires that has a suppression, a detrimental effect on their microbes to protect it. But we do know, based on this and this. I showed you the earlier study of the chamber in this, that if you fill a room full of plants, uh, it will not enhance the airborne microbes. Now, a lot of plants have been falsely accused of causing mold problems because people will overwater them and then the carpet will get damp around them, but plants themselves are not guilty. Now, the first building public building to install a plant is part of a, a means to control sick building syndrome without ventilation. Uh, is this. It's a new math and science building on the campus of the Northeast Mississippi Community College. They just built a new math and science building. And as you enter it, there's an atrium. It's a three-story building. There's an atrium up to the second floor. And the second floor and first floor, the entrance part is surrounded by offices, conference rooms, and secretaries. There's about a 4,000 square foot area on the first and second floors that I work with the architect in the design of it. And it is sealed off as far as air intake. It has its own air intake, and you can completely eliminate any ventilation. In other words, there's no air brought into it. You can adjust it, but the way it is now, there's no air brought into it. The air is circulated inside, and plants are used in a real world, real time problem. And here it is a kind of a cutaway. And this too uses bathrooms to feed the system so they never have to water feed it. Uh, now, keeping in mind, in a uh, university or college, you may have conferences, you may have more people than it's planned for. So you see those overflow, the sides overflow, so when they have a conference there, 
and there's more flushing than normal, uh, the system will overflow out and feed truck. Uh, normally, it would just feed the indoor plants. Now, here's what it looks like, and this is when it first went in. It's been in over a year, and all of those offices right adjacent to it, there's never been a complaint in the year. I keep a close check on it. You have any sick building symptoms? No symptoms. Again, you see, it looks just like a regular planter. You wouldn't know if you went in, like someone told you. No special modular units are put in. Uh, you don't see any waste. You don't smell any waste. You don't know what's there. You just see plants. Here's the outside shrubber when it's first put in. That is the outside filter system. Uh, so that when excess use of the system you know, overflow, it feeds the system out here. Now, this is the Embassy Suite Hotel, downtown Washington. It's where I stay when I go to harass the beer place. Um, it, it's a nine-story atrium. I know the landscape people that maintain this there in Washington. That's why I started staying here. These are real plants. These are living plants. That's a stream. There's fish. It's kind of like Noah's Ark. It is tropical rainforest. Inside this building, Embassy Suites Hotel, uh, you can go down and have breakfast, have a cool one, whatever, uh, and enjoy a nice, clean, fresh environment. Now, unfortunately, when you go back into your room, you go into a stuffy old room because it doesn't get the nice clean air that nature has put out in this tropical rainforest. It was put in purely for aesthetics. So you young architects out here, when you design one in the future, go all the way with it. Tie it all in. You can still have this, but have those rooms where they get this nice, clean, fresh, pure air that's pulled through it and the waste from the room feeds the whole system. So what we're doing is we're designing plants into buildings now. We don't need any new technology. Uh, we're putting jungles in buildings now. We're putting them there for aesthetics. And with just a little bit of understanding of how nature created planet Earth, you can do wonders as an architect in the future of have each building like a little Earth. And you don't have to worry about sick building syndrome and ventilation rates and all the mechanical devices that uh, they're struggling with now. Uh, it's, it's understanding how nature works and how we can work hand in hand. Shopping mall. It's just an example of how if you tie this in to the air. Now when you go into those fabric stores and carpet stores and your eyes burn and your throat tickles and 20 years later you come down with cancer, you wouldn't have to have that if you had this air circulated through nature's perfect clean life. And it does, plants do more than just clean the air and look looking nice. They humidify the air. Nature spent a billion years putting all this together. And we, uh, we will have to wise up and, and understand how to use it and get back in harmony with nature and properly utilize all our genius mechanical devices too. We still need them. Now, you're looking at the future wastewater treatment systems in cities like New York, Tokyo. See that large building? It's now they park cars. Throughout these buildings, they have no place to put cars. Now, when I lecture, and I'm going to give you a little bit until I'm going to have some time to think, to show you about outside Mars system, how do we treat the waste? They're pumping it in, the, uh, in New York, uh, California, Sydney. They're pumping it out into the ocean. Put these buildings throughout the city, aesthetically designed by your architects of the future, uh, designed it with shells like parking Put these planter systems like you've seen in my home and in this new building, a whole building and pump the waste or allow, collect the waste from small systems throughout the city, let it come into the basement, which is a septic tank, a sealed concrete chamber, 
where the solids are digested and the bile gas that's produced, mostly methane, methane, carbon dioxide, hydrochloric can be used in the building as a source of uh, energy, uh, either for lighting or heating, then pump that from that septic tank up to the top of that, let it flow through these modular units, tropical rainforest, and as it flows from one floor down, drops back down, you gain that energy back that you expended pumping it up there, going down up through aeration, aspiration, coming back down through the building, and when you reach the bottom, you will have clean, pure water, which in 50 years from now will be as valuable as gold in certain parts of the world. It can be done. It's a technology that's here. It's not a myth. It's not a fad. And what I've tried to do is bring you step by step of how we put it together. Uh, and it's happening. It's going to happen. Now, this is the indoor part, which hasn't gone quite as far as the outdoor part of using plants, marsh plants. And I'm going to show you a little bit about that. I'm going to wrap it up through that. Now, we covered the house plants. Now we cover the aquatic plants, the cattail, the bulrushes, the uh, pickle weeds, the duck weeds. The simplest form of that, and for you landscape architects, uh, you take the waste from the building, again, put it in a buried septic tank to get the sonic digested. From there, it is not sewage. It is a nature's perfect neutral. It's super, better than miracle. It's what nature intended. It has all the trace elements and nutrients. Treat it not as a waste. It's a fertilizer, a liquid, hydroponic solution, and feed landscape with it. And use it to grow plants with, and either use it all up or use it to a point where the water is clean and you can put it back into the lake or the stream or wherever, whatever you want to do with it. But it can be done, and again, if you use it in these hydroponic systems with rock filters and outside, we're using rock filters, you can design it to where the waste is deep enough down below the surface so that you can put water-loving plants or non-water-loving plants in it. You saw what was inside, house plant? You can do the same thing outside with plants that can tolerate, that can tolerate the climate, depending on what part of the country you are. Now, the first one, we built our house 12 years ago out in the country. I remember my wife would not consider it an indoor sewage. So we built an outdoor system. And then what I was testing, and the most effective one, was fragmented wheat, common wheat. So we planted it. And you look at what she says, hey, this thing is ugly. Not aesthetic. I want flowers. Get them out of here. So I went to work over the next two or three years digging those things out. I'm still digging them out 12 years later. But I planted a more aesthetically desirable plant, ginger lilies. They have flowers. They, they bloom down south, anywhere from the middle of the summer on into the fall. Ginger lilies, they have an aroma like gardenia. If you go out in my yard now, you smell, you smell like gardenia. It's all over the place. So it's an example. You can take your wastewater, use it as a valuable nutrient source, to grow aesthetically desirable, pleasing plants, landscape, whatever type of landscape you want to use, your limitation is your imagination. Here's another one, a waterfront development. We use a little different configuration. It has a septic tank, large of elephant ears, very aesthetically desirable. It soaks up all of the uh, nutrients and minerals in the waste and comes out with clean water. A church uh, out from Pickham, they were far enough out, they couldn't tie onto the sewer system without costing them a fortune. Uh, they had a septic tank leach field and it's low down where I'm in. Groundwater, you go down about a foot or so and you're in the groundwater. Uh, they had sewage bubbling up in the leach field. They had the students out in Sunday school, little kids, and they were they had a health hazard. So they came to us for help, and we went and helped them design simple marsh system, very uncomplicated, so that uh, they could take that waste and meter it through. Uh, this you have to know how much volume to have and how much 
how many square feet and how much retention time you get to get whatever purity that you so desire. And that's the engineering aspect. So we've worked that out. Uh, and there's thousands of those. Uh, Kentucky has over a thousand last count. Tennessee over a thousand. I don't know how many thousand in Mississippi. Uh, in rural areas. Simple. Very simple. Back to nature. Design it properly. You won't see you won't see the waste, you won't smell any waste. Proper design. You must know what you're doing. It's got to be done properly, but if it's done properly, it's as simple and it's not complicated at all. It's complicated in if one tries to understand the ecology of what's going on, but just to look at it, you are farming waste. Farming waste. Mobile home park. Where then you see all those mobile homes? Built a park, a flower garden. Waste flows underneath. Flowers. Some of the data. BLD and suspended solids coming in, BLD and suspended uh, solids going out, and I throw that in there just in case there might be any engineers in there, I doubt if they are, uh, to show you the efficiency of cleaning up the waste. Uh, cold climate, here's a small town, Monterey, Virginia, in the, uh, up in the mountains near the West Virginia border, small town, up about 4,000 feet high, it gets very below. They have an outside wastewater treatment system using local native plants that can tolerate the cold climate. Uh, here's what it looks like in the wintertime. It's been in five, six years, worked beautifully. So you can have them in a cold climate outside. Of course, if you want to take them inside, it doesn't matter. But outside, it's a little more of a challenge. You have to use native plants that can tolerate the climate. But keeping in mind that root microbes do 85 to 90 percent of the work. And what these plants do is keep a happy, content home for those microbes to build and, and do their thing. A small town in Mississippi of about 1,800, 1,900 people, they had an old mechanical, an old mechanical sewage treatment system. It was worn out. They still owed $300,000 on it. Uh, engineers wanted to give them another $1.2 or $3 million mechanical plant. We suggested that they go to a marsh system that cost far less than half that, and it still cost them $100,000 or more a year to operate, that uh, this marsh would cost them just a few thousand. What they did, we moved across the ditch from the old mechanical plant, put in one of the newer marshes, constructed wetlands, some people call it, dual channel. So that uh, we built it all kind of redundancies. So if you had to clean out one section, you turn a valve and convert it to another section. Uh, put uh, up front, we put small surface area, deep anaerobic lagoons, like open septic tanks. Put small aerators on the surface to oxidize them so that they don't work. Then it's fed into marshes, bulrush, duckweed, arrowhead again, polish it off. Nice clean water coming out, uh, doing it nature's way. Saving them. My hometown, Picayune, Mississippi, about 12,000 people, had an old mechanical plant, had an engineering study, says to replace that, take a couple, three million dollars, but their collection system, sewer collection system, had deteriorated to the point to where it cost them $11.5 million to replace all the collection system. I suggested that they put in a marsh, abandon this thing, dinosaur, and spend three or four hundred thousand dollars for the marsh, spend about a million dollars to patch up the worst infiltration manholes where the stormwater was going in, instead of paying something like 14, 15 million dollars, uh, about 1.2, 1.3 million dollars to do it. They did. Of course, there was a long, controversial bloodbath in between with the engineers, the state, and the regulatory agents. But once all the blood was cleared away, uh, the city went with it. They hung in there. And here's what it looks like. There's the old mechanical dinosaur that's sitting over there. Uh, it's farming the waves. Farming. It's a farming operation. Uh, this one uses only duckweed. Little flowing coal tolerant duckweed. And when you dry this duckweed, it has the same, you can feed it, just dry it. It has the same food value as soybean beans. And you can grow as much high quality protein on one acre of sewage farming as you can on 10 acres of soybeans, which you have to fertilize and farm and till. 
This is what the future looks like. Here's the data comparing the uh, quality of the protein. Amino acid profile of dried duck weed grown in domestic soil as opposed to soil. Now this is looking, we've got to go through a lot of changes to get this, but this is what is going to happen. It's not whether it's going to happen, it's how much of a problem do we have to have to change people's way of thinking, how much pressure must we put on, and, and it's kind of our money. Our, the state of our economy is rising. As long as we had plenty of money and grant money to give these little towns, they didn't care what was put in. Mechanical grants put in as long as they had to pay for it. Our economy is in trouble. It's going to get worse nationally. And the government is, doesn't have the money to give all the little towns grant money to put in anything that they so desire. They have to pay for it. And when you have to pay for it, you're a little more concerned about what you put in and if someone's giving it to you for free. So the future is not so dim environmentally anyway. Chemical, toxic chemicals, we can also use these to remove toxic chemicals as an example. This is the first toxic chemical waste that was, I put in for NASA in 1974. It's been in 20 years. It uses floating water hyacinths to remove toxic chemicals from photographic waste, laboratory waste, heavy metals, organics. It's still operating 20 years. It probably had to cost them over a few hundred dollars in all 20 years. Didn't wear out, won't wear out. Here's some of the data. At the first year it was in operation. DOD, POC, COD, and some of it that doesn't mean anything. But it shows the efficiency of natural system, removing heavy metals, organics. Here's another large chemical complex out of Mobile, Alabama, uh, four huge chemical plants. They've got a multi-million dollar uh, treatment plant in, but still there's some toxic chemicals in it, traces, and that waste goes into Mobile Bay where all the oysters and shrimp that they grow, that they, they see. The Audubon Society was all these people's back some fears. They came to me about seven, eight years ago. Uh, I worked with them. This is floating torpedo brass. Uh, Use it to polish the waste, took out the toxic chemicals, treated nice, been in operation about eight years, cost them very little of Very little. They paid me, the Audubon Society was happy, the industry, uh, uh, the environmentalists, and we all went out smiling. So, not always does it happen that way, but it can. Now, that's a brief rundown, and I'm a little bit over my hour. I think that, uh, well, I've got one more. This is another chemical plant of in Arkansas, Magnolia, Arkansas. So you have a huge chemical complex in the background. They, they created a marsh where they have ducks and wildlife. And this large chemical company has hired two or three people, PR people, to do nothing but take tours, take environmental groups and students through to show them how they are good neighbors, how they are in complete harmony with the environment, and how the water that they put into the stream is cleaner than the water that's in the stream, and it didn't bankrupt them. So, industry is catching on. A lot of people, it's a technology that's moving rapidly. And uh, I think if, if we were to summarize, if I have spent the past 25 years of my life putting together the puzzles and pieces of nature in a way to clean our environment. Now, I don't say that I have all of the answers. We don't have all of the answers, but we have enough of the answers that we can't afford to wait anymore. And as you've seen, there's some real world things. I live in the bio home. Oh, years ago, saw sick building syndrome. This new building. So it's happening and it's going to happen. And you young people here, you are the future. And I think you're going to pick up the ball and run. problems we went through a cycle which the interior people would do that in the winter time they would drop the temperature down to about 55 degrees for one place to do and, and up to see what plants could tolerate that real world condition. Uh, we found that Chinese evergreen was a plant 
after about the second year, couldn't tolerate it. We had to change them out. Other than that, the plants, a lot of them grow. Once they get so tall, you have to move them out and put smaller plants in. And you maintain them. There'll be dead leaves like any plants. Uh, it's, it's the same thing as the plants you have in a home now. Low maintenance system. And occasionally, if you have, and we've had a few problems with spider mice infestation. Remember, they're all in little portable units. You can take them out. You can spray them in there. In my case, I close the glass doors, and I've got these little high-efficiency filters. So that if I wanted to spray pesticide in, I can purge the room within an hour. Or you can take them out and take them to a chamber. So it's designed with a very ease of maintenance, and it has to be for wide application of use. Yes? What I've done, I'm, I'm working on a book, but I, I'm so busy now in lecturing, I, I may never complete it. I did a package of papers covering like industrial waste, indoor air pollution, and domestic waste. I've got a couple of papers, I think I, I get them here, that they, they might get copies of. Some of them are put together, and there's a couple of technical ones. There's a wide variety of references of from the literature that you can go and have your library get. Yeah, so that would be enough for you. Are there any special treatments in your older climate conditions that you would have to consider? What? The one up in um, Monterey, which is the, the coldest one I'm involved, they're all over now. A lot of them I'm not involved in, but the one that I've been involved in for about eight years is that we thought when we designed it that we had to have more contact time or retention time because of the cold weather. Now that particular one, it's turned out that it didn't require that. that the treatment in the winter time when it was covered with snow uh, was just about the same as in the summertime. Now there's a lot of these systems that are in, and I'm not personally involved in, in North Dakota and Canada where they have the open channel systems, it's not rocks. And in those, what they have to do in the winter time, they have to have it where they bring the water level up about 12 more inches for that frozen ice layer and use it as an insulation as the water flows underneath. And again, it's critical that you use native plants, cattails, bulrushes. Uh, I was amazed at some of the data that they got in Canada, the little shallow ones, that was almost comparable to what we were getting in South Mississippi, those compared. Uh, little, require a little more attention time, but I was surprised at it. Yes? Um, I noticed a little back in the beginning of the year that you used a lot of grasses instead of plants so much. Yes. Um, um, why didn't you just use the grass in your own? You can use grass, but you got to remember now, You've got to design a system that you feed the waste underneath the root system. Sure, you can, most in, in yards, we're into landscape architect now. But what we look at is we look at plants that are aesthetic, and I think we'll start moving into shrubbery. There's no reason why you couldn't use a, a legustrums or, or any of the uh, shrubs and that one would like to. But I think with not the open channel. If, you, if you're going to grow them in an open water, you're restricted because certain plants will grow in certain depths of water. But when you use these filters, rock filters, where you don't see any waste, I don't see any restrictions. With a little manipulation, you can grow anything you want to. And some of those people are in their sewer system get in to grow things like tomatoes, which I discourage because of the, the health department's <coughs> feelings on waste and viruses. I don't think there's any health involved because with NASA, we screen all of that because, keep in mind, we grew them for NASA, we grew them in our waste, food plant. The only ones we were a little leery of was lettuce because of a pestilential uh, amoeba that causes a many dysentery. Uh, but I checked back through the countries in Asia that's been growing plants and uh, raw waste for thousand years, uh, which is quite different from what we're, we're doing. We're putting it in a way to, to biologically 
disinfected, whereas most of theirs are just put out into the open fields. Did I see a hand somewhere else? Oh, okay. Since he uses duck weed, what do you do with all the excess duck weed? You must step to the part of it. Remember all the feed? We're going to harvest it. What we've done is, if you notice that, when we had little floaters, point floor pipes, they float in, you can pull them back, and you can skim the duckweed, and we have a special harvesting chamber where we can collect it and harvest it. And now, we're, we're just now trying to get the, enough of the raw material there to entice some entrepreneur to come in and set up an operation. Now that you can further harvest it, disc it in, or put it in the garden. It's, as long as you disc it in, keep it in mind, it's high in protein, and if you pile it up, and it starts to ferment, it's another problem. 